All right. Well, I'm going to go ahead and get started. Um, welcome. And thanks again for joining us for today's webinar on Partnership Wild and Scenic Rivers. This is the second of six webinars in our 2022 Wild and Scenic webinar series. And in today's webinar, we're going to learn a little bit about the history of Partnership Wild and Scenic Rivers, the roles of the different groups involved, and benefits to the partnership approach to wild and scenic river management. But first, I'd like to introduce myself. My name is Angie Furman, and I am the River Training Center Coordinator for River Management Society. And I'm gonna be helping moderate today's session, along with my colleague, Risa Shimoda, who might be joining us in be behind the scenes. For those who are new to River Management Society, or a reminder to those who are familiar, we support the individuals who study, protect, and manage North America's rivers. And we do this through communication, outreach, training, and resource sharing. Membership uh, allows you to stay connected and up-to-date with what's happening in river management topics and related areas, as well as share opportunities, questions, solutions, jobs, and other resources with members. A couple of the things I'd like to point out is we do have a discount, for example, for this series, as, long, as well as our River Access Planning Series for RMS members. We have some fun events like chapter trips starting to be scheduled for this summer. And we also have our symposium that we're starting to work on, which will be coming up next year in early 2023. But before we get started, I also want to take a moment to let you know that today's presentation is being recorded and it will be available in about 24 hours on the RMS video channel. I'll also be sending this out to all of you who are in attendance today. So keep an eye out for an email about 24 hours from now. And on the page with the recording, you will also find PDF copies of the slides as well as the handout for today. And to get to that, I just want to point out that you can go to the RMS website, go to the Professionals tab, and then the River Training Center. And then once on the River Training Center page, that button on the top left-hand side there is going to take you to the video channel. So um, I also want to point out that today's material tracks along with the information found in module 12 of the Wild and Scenic Rivers course of study. If you're unfamiliar with this resource, it's a free and self-directed learning resource that can be accessed on rivers.gov by going to the resources tab and clicking on the WSR training modules. Also, if you're unfamiliar with rivers.gov, I highly encourage you to check it out. Lots of great resources provided by the Interagency Wild and Scenic Rivers Coordinating Council. Few more things to cover. Um, I just want to point out that in order to ask questions today, you're going to see a questions box. You can go ahead and put any questions or comments that you'd like to share with the presenters and myself today into that box. And we will take time throughout the presentation as well as at the end to answer any of your questions. And also there on your little what go to webinar control panel, you will find the little handout tab and you can see a handout with some links about partnership Wild and scenic rivers, as well as the information for today's presenters. I'm going to come back to the poll, but First, I would like to introduce today's presenters. I'm excited we've got Emma Lord and Ashley Conan joining us. And I'm gonna go ahead and let them introduce my introduce themselves right now. So why don't we start with you, Emma? Thanks, Angie. Uh, can you hear me okay? Perfect. Uh, thanks for joining everyone. I'm Emma Lord with the National Park Service with the Partnership Wild and Scenic Rivers Program, and I'm based out of Concord, New Hampshire. I'm Ashley Conan, and I am with the Wakaiba Wild and Scenic River down in Central Florida. And I am the river ambassador for this partnership river, and I've been in this position for about three and a half years. Awesome. Thanks, Ashley. And 
Emma. And now I'm gonna run that poll that you saw maybe pop up. We just like to know a little bit more about you all joining us today. So I'm gonna launch a poll asking, what is your familiarity with partnership wild and scenic rivers? So let us know if you're you're an expert and you're just joining to see the cool pictures, or if you're somewhat familiar, or if you've heard of it but need to learn more, or if you have no idea what partnership wild and scenic rivers are. So I'm gonna give it another three or four seconds here for you to go ahead and place your vote. Again, that's, again, there's no wrong answer. All right, I can see most everyone has voted. So I'm gonna close the poll and share these results. It looks like about half of you are here because uh, you've heard about Partnership Wild and Scenic Rivers, but need to learn a little bit more. So that's great to hear. You are in the right place. And I see that we've also got some people who are totally new to the idea as well as some experts. So this is a great range of people. All right, well, um, with that being said, glad you're all here and joining us. And I'm gonna pass it over to Emma, who's gonna get us started. Great, thanks Angie. I'm going to uh, turn my camera off so you guys can see full screen here. All right, so we before we dive into the, um, the real meat of the topic, I wanna provide a couple of resources where you can find some additional information. Um, and some of these websites will be listed in that handouts uh, PDF that Angie mentioned before. Um, so the first website is the National Park Services Partnership Wild and Scenic Rivers website. That provides a little background about the partnership model. It also provides links to all 16 of our um, partnership wild and scenic rivers, the local um, advisory committee pages. There's also the partnership wild and scenic rivers toolkit and newsletters, and those are housed on the River Management Society website. And the toolkit is a great resource, um, kind of breaks down the process, um, first kind of exploring partnership rivers, the process to study rivers, and then the designation process. So there's a lot of great resources in the toolkit. Um, and then you'll see some other resources uh, listed in the handout. So next, Angie, thanks. So today we'll all be about partnership wild and scenic rivers. We'll go over the history and evolution of the partnership approach, uh, specifically the National Park Service partnership model. Um, and again, you'll see the acronym PWSR um, frequently is used. Um, so we'll go over the principles of the partnership model, um, look at all the stakeholders and partners and see who does what, um, discuss some of the benefits of the model, look at the future of partnership rivers, where they're headed, um, and then provide some additional resources as well. So it looks like there's a pretty mixed bag of uh, participants, some with a lot of knowledge about partnership rivers and some with um, that are pretty new to it. So overall, we hope to increase your knowledge about uh, partnership wild and scenic rivers. So those are rivers that flow primarily through non-federal lands. Uh, we hope to build skills for partnering with local communities and other stakeholders, increase stakeholder participation in developing implement and implementing voluntary strategies, um, and support stakeholder discussions about the designation, designation of additional wild and scenic rivers uh, on non-federal lands, particularly in areas other than the Northeast, which currently most of the partnership wild and scenic rivers are focused in the Northeast. So partnership wild and scenic rivers are a subset of the national wild and scenic rivers system, which was created on October 2nd, 1968 through the passage of the Wild and Scenic Rivers Act. And here we have a, an excerpt from the act, which kind of summarizes the, the goals and objectives. Uh, it is hereby declared to be the policy of the United States that certain selected rivers of the nation, which with their immediate environments possess outstandingly remarkable scenic, recreational, geologic, fish and wildlife, historic, cultural, or other similar values shall be preserved in free flowing condition and that they and their immediate environments shall be protected for the benefit and enjoyment of present and future generations.
So when we look at most of the early wild and scenic designations, uh, they're rivers that flow primarily through public lands in the Western United States. And none of the original eight rivers that were designated in 1968 were located in the, the private lands dominated North, or northeastern part of the country. And it wasn't until the mid 1970s that Congress designated any rivers that were east of Wisconsin. Um, and even those designated rivers, uh, including the Chattooga, the Obed, the Middle Delaware, they all flowed primarily through state or federally owned lands. So 10 years later, 10 years after the, the Wild and Scenic Rivers Act was passed, we have the addition of the Upper Delaware River in 1978. And this marked the first time that a congressionally designated federally administered river that flowed primarily through private lands came with a stringent land acquisition cap. And this was the first instance where enabling legislation explicitly pre prescribed local zoning, not uh, federal restrictions to protect the federal, to protect the resources. Um, federal and local governments in the two states of New York and Pennsylvania, they formally worked together to develop land use protections. And Congress directed the National Park Service to develop land and water use guidelines and a management plan for the Upper Delaware River. And they worked with stakeholders, including the state of New York and the state of Pennsylvania, the Delaware River Basin Commission and local communities and all those stakeholders organized into a local management council. And unlike the subsequent partnership designations, the cooperative management plan for the Upper Delaware River was not prepared during the Wild and Scenic study process. And we'll talk a little bit more about that um, in the coming slides. So a decade after the Upper Delaware was designated, the Wildcat River in New Hampshire uh, was designated. And this was unique because it was the first time that a river management plan was written prior to the designation of the river into the national system. And the, up, and the Wildcat River designation only allowed acquisition of privately owned riverfront lands that were outside of the White Mountain National Forest through donation or with the consent of the landowner. So similar to the Upper Delaware River, an advisory council comprised of local representatives was established to guide the management and the local land use decisions that were outside of the boundaries of the National Forest in New Hampshire. So we jump ahead four more years and in 1992, the Great Egg Harbor River in New Jersey was really the first wild and scenic river designated under our current partnership wild and scenic river model. So along with this designation, uh, the river was also designated as a National Park Service unit. And this is the only partnership river with that distinction. Uh, the following partnership designations kind of steered away from that park unit model. So we have the late 1980s, early 1990s, the partnership model was really coming, coming to its own. Um, and the statutory basis for this model comes from Section 7, 11, excuse me, of the Wild and Scenic Rivers Act. So Section 11 was amended in October of 1986, and it expanded the cooperative authorities of federal agencies to work with state, local, and private entities on river protection. Section 11B1 authorizes the Secretary of the Interior, Secretary of Agriculture, or the head of any other federal agency to provide assistance and cooperate with states and other entities to plan, protect, and manage river resources. So this authority applies to federal and non-federal lands, and it's not limited to components of the National Wild and Scenic River System. It applies to all rivers across the country. And this cooperation typically occurs through a written agreement that provides for financial or other assistance from the Departments of Agriculture and Department of the Interior. So kind of that was a, a brief overview of the partnership approach. And this is kind of looking at the traditional wild and scenic river approach versus the partnership approach. So with the traditional model, we have rivers flowing mostly through federal lands. They're managed through federal agencies, mainly the National Park Service, US Forest Service, Bureau of Land Management and US Fish and Wildlife Service. And on the partnership side, we have rivers that are managed through locally led stewardship councils or management councils, and there is some level of federal support there, typically through the Park Service. 
Um, the river and resource protection is driven by local zoning and land use laws, and there is no federal acquisition of land for wild and scenic river purposes in the partnership model. And there's also a couple of links uh, on this slide that will be available in the PDF version. Um, there's a, a brief video from the US Forest Service that overviews the traditional wild and scenic river model. And then um, the National Park Service has a river connections video that outlines the partnership uh, model. So those are also great resources. All right, so now we've got another poll. And while I'm doing this poll, if you have any questions about the origins of the Partnership Wild and Scenic River model, feel free to put those in the questions tab. Again, we will be covering more about the different roles and some of the benefits as we go on. But uh, if you have any questions about the history or the origins, put those in that questions tab. And in the meantime, I'm gonna launch a poll. This one's more of a little quiz. And we are wondering, of all the wild and scenic rivers, how many are partnership wild and scenic rivers? So we've got a few different options there. And just as a reminder, out of all the wild and scenic rivers nationwide, wild and scenic rivers only account for less than 1% of all our rivers in our country. But how many of the wild and scenic rivers are partnership rivers? I can see some of the results coming in. We'll give it about five more seconds here. All right, I'm gonna go ahead and close that poll and share the results. Whoops, share the results again. And it uh, looks like 36% of you said 7% and you are correct. So about six or 16 out of the 226 wild and scenic rivers are partnership wild and scenic rivers. So I'm gonna hide those results. And I do have a question that came in, Emma. Um, and what, maybe if we wanna come back to this, we can, but I'm gonna go ahead and ask it now so you can start thinking about it. But what would be the motivation for a state to ask for federal designation as a wild and scenic river versus just use the state law? Yeah, I can uh, I can tackle, try to tackle that now. Um, so, yeah. If, if folks have attended some of the other webinars um, on wild and scenic rivers, a big kind of the, the main teeth of the Wild and Scenic Rivers Act is section seven, which prohibits any uh, federally assisted water resource projects from happening that would detrimentally impact the river. And it also puts a, um, a halt on any FERC licensed hydropower operations. Um, so in many aspects, that protection against additional development um, and projects that may harm the river, that's kind of, uh, in some cases, the reason why people seek a federal wild and scenic designation as opposed to, say, a state, state program, um, a state wild and scenic designation that some states have uh, scenic river programs. Um, so that's kind of, I would say that's probably the driving force. Um, also with the partnership model, there are some federal funds associated with that. Um, so funds come from the park service to our local partners to help implement the river management plans. Um, so there's that additional piece that may not be available in a state designated system. Great, thank you, Emma. Now I'm going to pass it over to Ashley. All right. So when you're considering a partnership wild and scenic river designation, it's important to consider a few factors. So you'll want to take into consideration if there is a foundation of local involvement and commitment. Are the surrounding lands owned by a federal entity? Are there locally prized resources? Are the local agencies willing partners? would congressional representatives be receptive to designation and is the river listed on the NRI? 
The NRI is the Nationwide Rivers Inventory, and it's a listing of more than 3,200 free-flowing river segments in the United States that are believed to possess one or more outstandingly remarkable natural or cultural values judged to be at least regionally significant. Eligibility for a partnership designation may be demonstrated in the NRI, but it is not required. Partnership rivers are managed by locally driven collaborative planning between local, state, and regional stakeholders and the National Park Service. This management approach to river conservation is an effective alternative to direct federal management and administration, which provides nationally designated river protection backed by federal protection for the watercourse and supported by federal funding. Local support and a motivated group to keep momentum up are important throughout the designation process and for long-term management. Community support for designation is key to the suitability of partnership wild and scenic rivers. And this may be shown in several different ways, depending on the local governance in the communities under which designation is being studied. The study, which is typically three years, gives you funding and tech expertise from the federal agency to write the comprehensive river management plan and study the eligibility and suitability of wild and scenic river designation. There are 16 rivers currently designated under the partnership model. The National Park Service administers partnership rivers in 10 states, and all of these are located east of the Mississippi. In these partnership wild and scenic rivers, communities protect their own outstanding rivers and river-related resources through a collaborative approach. A congressional study of the York River in Maine is complete, and Congress may consider legislation to designate the York River and its tributaries as a partnership river. Three more partnership wild and scenic rivers were designated in 2019. The Nashua, Squanacook, and Nisisset rivers in Massachusetts and New Hampshire, the Wood Pawtuck rivers in Rhode Island and Connecticut, and the Lower Farmington River and Salmon Brook in Connecticut. Under the partnership wild and scenic rivers model, the National Park Service and a locally based stewardship council made up of municipal, state, and other stakeholders implement projects to protect and enhance each designated river and its resources. These rivers boast varied geology, healthy forested landscapes, excellent fishing and paddling opportunities, diverse plant and animal communities, historic landmarks, and riparian scenery. The partnership rivers managed by the National Park Service flow almost entirely through privately owned non-federal lands. The partnership wild and scenic rivers approach is one that combines community stewardship and protection for locally important rivers with federal agency technical and financial support. The approach provides an opportunity for communities to work together at a regional scale for their shared resource. Partnership wild and scenic rivers are a subset of the national wild and scenic rivers system. Most were designated after a congressionally authorized study found them eligible and suitable for inclusion into the National Wild and Scenic River System. The one exception is the Westfield River, which was designated through Section 2A process and receives funding through congressional appropriations. Studies are usually initiated at the request of local residents, river conservation organization, and user groups. A wild and scenic river study may also be per perceived as a way to focus attention on a river's conservation needs, to increase intergovernmental coordination and cooperation, or to provide federal funds and staff assistance in the development of a river conservation plan. Rivers proposed for study are usually, but not always, listed in the NRI. An act of Congress is needed to list a river for study. It can take several years from introduction of the study legislation for a proposed study to be authorized, assuming that the proposal succeeds. By helping to identify major interest groups, this lead time often serves to enhance broad participation in the actual study process. For rivers that flow through non-federal lands, the dialogue among stakeholders that occurs while study legislation is being prepared can also help indicate the extent of local support for river protection. This is an important factor in the ultimate outcome of the study. 
without broad-based support for the exercise of local land use powers and voluntary conservation initiatives, study rivers that flow through non-federal areas are seldom found suitable for designation. In addition to identifying the department and agency responsible for the study, Congress also frequently provides specific direction concerning its scope and the involvement of stakeholders. Congress may also create a federal advisory committee to assist the study agency in gathering resource information about the river, assessing its conservation needs, and developing recommendations concerning the river's suitability for designation. Designation studies require determinations to be made regarding the candidate river's eligibility, classification, and suitability. Eligibility and classification represent an inventory of existing conditions. Eligibility is an evaluation of whether a candidate river is free flowing and possesses one or more outstandingly remarkable values known as ORVs. If found eligible, a candidate river is analyzed as to its current level of development, including water resource projects, shoreline development and accessibility, and a recommendation is made that it be placed into one or more of the three classes, wild, scenic, or recreational. Typically, a partnership wild and scenic river has been authorized by Congress for a duration of three years, though so congressional authorization for study support can be up to five years. This is a soft deadline, but by the end of that time, a study report and assessment of findings should be submitted to Congress by the federal agency tasked with the study. The National Park Service role includes technical assistance and in identifying and vetting the eligibility of your river, such as is it free flowing? Does it have outstanding values at the regional or national scale? They will also have attendance at public informational meetings to help explain the designation and address misconceptions, coordination with state or local governmental agencies on the study designation and more. Study committees are not one size fits all. Your com community gets to decide how your committee is set up. Option one is set up formally by the amendment to the Wild and Scenic Rivers Act that authorizes the study. The committee must abide by all the rules set forth under the Federal Advisory Committee Act, FACA. These committees are reviewed by the federal government and need to be given the go ahead to meet. Getting appointments to a FACA committee may be more onerous than state or local meeting rules, and if someone resigns, new appointees must go through the FACA process. Option two and three are very similar. Option two is an imp informal committee formed by the National Park Service, and option three is an informal committee formed by the local study sponsor. Both are set up by discussion and consensus at the local level and are not governed by FACA unless the local committee chooses to follow FACA guidelines. The study committee may choose how to govern itself, who is a voting member of the committee, and how information is shared in accordance with the management plan developed during the study. To be eligible for designation, a river must be free flowing and possess one or more outstandingly remarkable values. Outstandingly remarkable values are values that are river dependent, natural, cultural, or recreational resources that are unique, rare, or exemplary at a regional or national scale. Rivers are suitable if the river's free flowing character, water quality, and outstandingly remarkable values will be protected through designation, and that designation is found to be the best method for protecting the river corridor. The Act intentionally does not clearly define ORVs because they should be unique to each river and determined during the study period. While the range of resources that may be included as an ORV is broad, all values should be river related. Categories may include natural, historical, cultural, scenic, or recreational qualities. Though rivers have many valuable resources, in order to be an ORV, the Wild and Scenic Rivers Act states that the resource should be located in the river or on its immediate shorelands, generally within a quarter mile of either side of the river, 
contribute substantially to the functioning of the river's ecosystem and or owe their existence or location to the presence of the river. A nationally significant resource would be rare, unique, or exemplary at a national scale. For example, a recreational boating experience that draws visitors from all over the nation would qualify as a nationally significant recreational resource. If your river is eligible, then you need to demonstrate suitability. This final procedural step provides the basis for determining whether or not to recommend a river as part of the national system. A suitability analysis is designed to answer the following questions. Should the river's free-flowing character, water quality, and ORVs be protected, or are there one or more other uses important enough to warrant doing otherwise, such as hydroelectric power? Will the river's free-flowing character, water quality, and ORVs be protected through designation? Is it the best method for protecting the river corridor? Is there a demonstrated commitment to protect the river by any non-federal entities who may be partially responsible for implementing protective management? In addition, the National Park Service created more questions to ascertain the suitability of partnership wild and scenic rivers. They are, are existing protection measures adequate to conserve the river's outstanding resources without the need for federal land acquisition or federal land management? Is there an existing or proposed management framework that will bring the key river interests together to work toward the ongoing protection of the river? What local support exists for river protection and national designation? And what would the effects of designation be on the land use, water base, and resources associated the river, such as neighboring communities? In answering these questions, the benefits and impacts of wild and scenic river designation must be evaluated, at, evaluated and alternative protection methods considered. Unlike most other wild and scenic rivers, management plans for partnership rivers are developed locally by municipal representatives with assistance from the National Park Service and approved before designation by the local governing body. This approach ensures that voters know in advance how the rivers will be managed if designated into the national system. Development of the management plan during the study process provides an opportunity for the municipalities to work together at a regional scale for their shared resource and provides communities with the structure, expertise, and funding to identify key issues and goals for long-term river and watershed protection. Whether Congress designates the river or not, the management plan belongs to the local stakeholders and can be implemented individually or collectively. If your river is eligible and suitable and you've written your CRMP, then you can get your congressional representatives on board to sponsor designation legislation. All right, so we have a few minutes for any questions that might have come up during that. So if you do have any questions, you can type them into the question box and I can read them out loud for our presenter. And right now, Ashley, I don't see any yet, but we'll give it another Oh, a few seconds here, in case anyone's currently typing. Sounds good. And again, if you have any questions that come up during the presentation, we're also going to have time at the end of today's presentation to answer them. So just in case you want to type one in and we come back to it later. I don't see any questions right now, um, but I'll encourage everyone to keep thinking while we go to our next poll. And this one is just a yes or no question. I'm going to go ahead and launch it now. So does the ownership of land change after a partnership wild and scenic river is designated? So we're checking to see if you're paying attention. Um, 
And we also just really like to emphasize this point. So I can see most of you have voted. So I am going to go ahead and close the poll and share the results. And it looks like 100% of you are correct. No, the ownership of land does not change after a partnership while the scenic river is designated. Awesome. Going to hide those results and then pass it back over to Emma. Great, thanks. Good to see everyone was listening. Got that correct. Um, so as we talked about, there are a lot of different partners and stakeholders involved in this partnership model. Um, and the success of this model really relies on the individual contributions of a number of entities. And each entity supports the partnership in a different way. The administering agency, which is typically the National Park Service, provides the technical and financial assistance, typically via a cooperative agreement to a partner organization and the local river council. The administering agency also conducts all Section 7 reviews. The partner organizations, and that might be a watershed association or a land trust, they coordinate with local officials and the river management council, and they often serve as a fiduciary role for the council. Partners and river councils jointly implement the river management or river stewardship plan and they conduct stewardship activities. And nonprofit groups support these activities through voluntary actions such as providing matching funds, um, mapping expertise, doing education outreach programs, or conducting various types of research. They also kind of serve that role um, in talking with their local congressional representatives about, um, about the program and helping to continue funding for the program into the future. Thanks, Emma. We're gonna go to a short video here about the Wakaiva Wild and Scenic River that Ashley works with. But first, uh, I did see a question come in and this could go to Ashley or Emma. Um, Christopher was asking the if the designation has to go out to the public for a vote. I can tackle that one. Um, so that's a really great question. Um, as Ashley mentioned, that suitability component of a uh, potential designation is whether local stakeholders and communities are on board. Um, so typically when there's the three-year study process happens, it's typically brought to the local municipalities, um, whether it's, uh, depending on local governance, um, it could be select board or town meeting vote, as, as is the case um, in a lot of communities in New England and the Northeast. Um, basically, do they support the designation? Do they support the management plan? And really the results of that municipal voting or decision making um, dictate whether the river would be suitable. So if there is that support, then that shows that, you know, the local communities are on board and they're supportive of the designation. And if there's not that support, that may, you know, the river may be deemed not suitable for designation because there's not that local support. Um, so there is typically a local voting process that's involved, and that's part of the, the wild and scenic study, the suitability component of it. Great. Thanks, Emma. All right. Well, now I'm going to share a short video with you here. Let me get it pulled up and ready to go.
Wow, I always get so inspired after watching that video. Uh, Ashley, you and your team did an awesome job putting that together. And now I'm gonna pass it over to you, you Ashley, to talk a little bit about the benefits. All the right, thank you. Yeah. Sounds good. I can tell you from, that's not on the slide, but one of the benefits after working together as a partnership for 20 years now since our designation that our partnerships are stronger than ever. So that is definitely part of it as well. Um, but in addition, there's a lot of benefits to the partnership wild and scenic river designation. And this can be benefits to municipalities, businesses, residents, and landowners along the rivers. Uh, some of these benefits are that you will have the comprehensive river management plan and you can implement that regardless of the actual designation. Of course, national recognition and prestige, a boost to the local economy, especially if the wild and scenic designation is promoted. Um, you also can utilize federal agency technical and financial assistance to implement the river management plan in improvement projects. Cooperative agreements are the primary mechanism used to provide assistance, including supplemental federal agency funding um, and continued collaboration within stakeholder groups. Some additional benefits, uh, they will increase the ability to leverage additional grants for a range of activities, such as fish passage enhancements, land protection and youth education, agency review of federally assisted water resource project to protect locally identified river values and a locally appointed river council that provides long-term framework to guide future management across local jurisdictions. So Ashley just went over a couple of the benefits of designation. Um, and as I mentioned previously, the first Partnership River was designated in 1992. So now actually this will be the 30th year. Um, so 30 years of Partnership Rivers. Um, these are a couple of examples of some of the great work that's been happening on, on the 16 rivers over the years. We have enhancement and improvement of public canoe accesses. This is the, um, the Lamprey River in New Hampshire on the upper uh, left. Um, there's been dam removal projects to restore fish, fish passage, um, lots of youth education and outreach events, river festivals that really bring people out and spread the word about uh, wild and scenic rivers and the benefits of designation and just getting people out to enjoy the rivers. Um, wildlife studies and protection of wildlife um, and a lot of great work working on land protection. So the local stewardship or river management councils work with local land trusts and municipalities to preserve land along the rivers, along the tributaries and throughout the watershed. Um, and many of the local stewardship councils have community grant programs. So they offer funding for municipalities, other organizations, to apply for um, projects that would help benefit and protect and enhance the rivers and in one way, shape or form, whether that's invasive species management or um, you know, developing interpretive panels uh, for outreach and education or holding other events. Um, so that, as Ashley mentioned, really helps to strengthen those partnerships of different groups and entities working along the designation. So we've been talking a lot about the uh, the National Park Service Partnership Wild and Scenic Rivers model. Um, and all of these rivers are located in the eastern half of the country, but there are also successful partnerships that exist on other wild and scenic rivers as well. Um, so other wild and scenic rivers, including the Upper Deschutes in Oregon, flow through significant blocks of non-federal lands. And these successful partnerships that exist uh, among a variety of stakeholders um, really help in guiding the management of the non-federal riverfront lands and coordinating multiple, sometimes overlapping planning efforts. The development of these, uh, specifically these US Forest Service river partnerships on the upper Deschutes coincided with the partnership model that was established by the Park Service in the Northeast. And both use similar approaches to solve similar challenges. And the success of these partnerships creates an opportunity to build on both of these models and provides an avenue for the designation of additional wild and scenic river segments on non-federal lands in other parts of the United States, not just the Eastern United States. So 
So that was a lot of information to take in, and we wanted to provide some additional resources uh, where you can find more information. Um, so at the beginning of the webinar, I mentioned the National Park Service Partnership Wild and Scenic Rivers webpage. Um, there's also the George Wright Forum article on Partnership Wild and Scenic Rivers that kind of gives, gives some of the historical perspective as well. Um, and as always, feel free to reach out to myself or other National Park Service staff um, in the Northeast and the Southeast, um, as well as US Forest Service staff in Region 6 um, for more information. And again, there is that handout um, that Angie mentioned at the beginning that you can find some of these links and other, other areas for resources. All right, well, now we have uh, some time for questions and discussion, and I did see a couple questions come in. Uh, the first one, it, it's kind of really getting back to that voting question that we had kind of tackled before, um, or touched on, not tackled, but um, Deborah said that some states are easier than others to get something on the ballot. And does the federal law take into consideration of state law? And then she asks, as there's been a situation, has there been a situation where a state legislature had to vote on whether this question was allowed to be on the ballot? Not sure if Emma or Ashley, you know the answer to that. And if not, we can always um, do a little research and follow up with Deborah. Um, I think my shorter answer is I would need to follow up, uh, do some additional research and follow up. I think um, off the top of my head, I can't think of any examples where um, a state legislature would need to approve, say, a ballot question. Um, typically, the ballot questions or um, referendums happen on the local municipality scale. Um, so at least in the Northeast, uh, I'm not aware of any any situations where the state um, was really involved in terms of a, a ballot question or referendum. But I will uh, do some research and I could get back to you. And then um, on the same topic of state stuff, but a little bit different, Jack asked, can you explain or provide examples of the role a state agency such as a state park through which a river flows may play during a Pacific, a partnership wild and scenic river study, and then the role that that state agency, such as a park, might play after the designation. And then Jack followed up with, how might a state park's plans for expansion of recreation opportunities be impacted by a study or a designation? Um. I can try and take the first part of that. I mean, for the study part, they could potentially be on that study committee um, to kind of help guide where the study goes. Uh, as far as after designation, they could be on the committee that manages the river system and talking with other partners, so heavily involved in what is going on and may, you know, just staying aware of what the rest of the partners are um, are planning for their uh, for other areas along the river system. And then what was the third part again, Angie? It is, how might a state park's plans for expansion of recreation opportunities be impacted by the study or designation? Okay, so personally from the Wakaiba, the state parks can come to our committee because they're an active member of the committee and um, things like erosion control or boat ramp improvements or trail access are all in our management plan. So we could, the committee could help fund some of those projects and provide additional support for those projects. And then I'll hand it over to Emma if she has anything else to add. Yeah, that, that's a great answer, Ashley. Um, I would just add to that that Again, during the study process, that's really when all the stakeholders need to be at the table. And as Ashley mentioned, the local state park could be on the study committee, um, kind of going through the process of understanding what the ORVs are, um, understanding you know, the recommendations that should be included in the management plan. 
And again, with the partnership wild and scenic designation, the river management plan is developed prior to actually being designated. So that study process is really used to create the management plan. And if, for example, the state park is involved in that process, any concerns that they have about uh, you know, potential future expansion of river access, that would be voiced during that planning process. So really trying to get all those stakeholders as much involved as much as possible from the early early going really helps with any issues that may arise with different land use concerns or expansion of facilities like that. Thanks, Emma and Ashley. Jack, let us know if that didn't answer your question or if you have any follow-up questions. I see a question came in from Brooke asking, is the Partnership Wild and Scenic River Program trying to expand to include other wild and scenic rivers that are not partnership rivers? If so, what types of things can be done to make more wild and scenic rivers partnership rivers? That's a great question. Um, and I guess maybe for clarification, um, I kind of see two potential parts to that. One, um, can existing wild and scenic rivers that are not partnership wild and scenic rivers, can they kind of be converted to the partnership model? And the second part being any new wild and scenic designations, um, can we expand this model to other parts of the country? Um, I think the second, second part of that, um, we have been, in the Northeast at least, we've been getting some uh, additional inquiries about potential new uh, partnership wild and scenic river studies in the Northeast and kind of expanding geographically out from that as far as um, Wisconsin and kind of the Midwest. But it kind of just so happens that all of the partnership designations, it started in the Northeast and that's kind of where they've been focused other than um, the Wakaiva in Florida, but it's definitely um, a model that would serve other rivers well across the country. Um, and in terms of the first part, if there's current wild and scenic rivers that are not in the partnership model, but could they kind of be converted to it? I think um, kind of a first step, some, some of the designated rivers have friends groups um, that participate in a lot of, you know, partner with the federal agencies to participate in stewardship activities. And I think that's kind of um, the first step towards a more partnership um, stakeholder engaged model is to have a friends group and getting getting multiple entities involved that all have a stake in the river and resources. Um, so that's kind of, I would say, a first step um, towards that partnership model. Um, I'm not sure if that completely answered your question or not. <laughs> Thanks, Emma. Brooke, feel free to post any follow-up questions if that did not answer your uh, question. And I have not seen any other questions come in, but I would like to point out, I did just put the link to the YouTube video for the Wakaiva River that we just shared a little bit ago. So if you wanna pass that along or check that out again, there's that link to the YouTube video. And I do also want to just remind you all that in today's handout, which will be um, posted in the description of today's video recording, you also have the contact information for both Emma and Ashley, in case you have any questions that come up after today's webinar. We do still have a few more minutes for questions. So if there's anything else, now's your time to ask. And while you're thinking of some questions, again, I just wanna say thanks so much to Emma and Ashley for sharing all this great information today. I'm really looking forward to seeing how this partnership model can expand in the future and we can have more rivers that are protected as wild and scenic. And then I also want to highlight that next month, again on the third Wednesday of the month, we have the next 
webinar in our Wild and Scenic webinar series. It's going to be on March 16th, same time as today. And we're going to be starting to jump into Section 7 of the Wild and Scenic Rivers Act, which deals with water resources projects and uh, starting to talk a little bit about what that is, what that means for the management of a wild and scenic river or even a suitable wild and scenic river. And then in April, we're going to be going even further into Section 7 and looking at Section 7 and, and NEPA and um, Section 7 of the Wild and Scenic Rivers Act, I should say, and NEPA and how those go together. In May, we are going to be doing a little bit more about outstandingly remarkable values, which you heard us mention several times today. And then in June, we're going to be looking at steps to address user capacities. So really encourage you to go to our website and uh, look at all the rest of the webinars in this series and sign up for those. And then I also want to point out that we have some free river management roundtables. Um, we actually host these twice a month. And the uh, next one is going to be on February 22nd next week. It's going to be pretty interesting. I think we're going to be looking at land acknowledgments and the purposes, practices, and perspectives around those, and especially how they relate to rivers. So thinking about like a land acknowledgement or territorial acknowledgement for the river that you work on. And then on March 8th, we are going to have an awesome presentation and discussion about the Klamath River Dam Removal, which is a big project coming up, one of the largest dam removal projects in the history of the U.S. So I encourage you to check those out. But uh, let's see if any other questions have come in. I saw someone ask, um, well, they're, they stated that they're a river manager for a river that primarily has privately owned shoreline, and but it was not designated as a partnership river. Are there resources or other rivers that have built river collaboratives or partnership groups that supported federal agencies that had little control of the shoreline? And that's a great question. Um, I see. Let's see here. Sorry, I'm getting my controls here. Risa, I saw that you and started to, or answered that one, but I can't see the full response. Hi, there are federal wild scenic rivers where the ownership is on private land and the management, it's not technically a management, but there's a collaborative, maybe not official, that um, helps protect the landowners interest so i just said we'd follow up with a link or two for casey great thanks risa mm -hmm. any other questions today well i don't see any more but if you do have any that come up again feel free to reach out to the presenters or reach out to me training at river-management.org, or you can also shoot me an email at angie at river-management.org. And uh, just wanna say thank you again so much to all of you for joining us today and to our presenters, Emma and Ashley, thank you so much and Looking forward to staying in touch and hearing about all the great things that you're doing for Partnership Wild and Scenic Rivers. Thanks, Angie. Right, Thanks, all. Yeah, it looks like we ended a little early, so I'll give you back some of your time in your day and hope you all have a great rest of your Wednesday. <laughs>